What's up gamers? Welcome to Gamer Rant. My name's Kevin. In today's episode, we are going to checking out the podcast to see what Phil Spencer had to say about all the current rumors that are circulating about exclusives and well he didn't touch on all of them but mostly exclusives and what he has to say in the podcast in general so let's check it out either of those titles are starfield or indiana jones they are not starfield <coughs> well what was the criteria and how the team was thinking about selecting those four titles let me start a little bit outside of that and then i'll get to the four specific games that we're talking about right now because the, the fundamental decision driver for any decision that we make, anything we're going to talk about today, is the long-term health of Xbox. That we're running a growing platform that is reaching more players, that our games are having as much success as possible. And I do have a fundamental belief that over the next five or ten years, exclusive games, games that are exclusive to one piece of hardware, are going to be a smaller and smaller part of the game industry. And that's not some great insight, because if you look at the last ten years and what the biggest games are today, it's a natural place. Whether it's one console and PC, multiple consoles, mobile console and PC, you see big games landing on multiple platforms. And we want to be a great platform for creators that are trying to realize that potential. But now back to the specific... Okay, so for me, I actually kind of agree with him in the sense that, like... In the long run, we could end up seeing less and less exclusives. And here's the reason why. Now, when I think of this, I think of, like, s exclusives that are actually produced by the console manufacturer. Meaning they started up a, a development company um, and they had them producing exclusive games for them. I'm not talking about... Uh, limited run exclusives, like, for example, Final Fantasy uh, 16, basically being a paid exclusive. That, to me, is not an exclusive. It does not count in any facet that thereof. And I think that is definitely a portion of this exclusivity that should objectively die in the gaming industry. And we need to go more back to what you know, exclusives used to be and represent. And if we do that, and even if we don't do that, and we still see a combination of, you know, studio-driven exclusives rather than paid exclusives, I feel that ultimately the line down the road is going to get less and less and less. But whether or not... That's because people are getting tired of paid exclusives, which me personally, I am. I think like Final Fantasy 16 should have objectively been on all platforms. And honestly, my hot take is I ultimately feel that no console manufacturer should objectively be able to give these companies money to put their game exclusively on a single um, system. The only exception to that is if the company themselves make that decision. We're going to create this brand new IP. It's going to be exclusive to PlayStation. We're going to create this brand new IP. It's going to be exclusive to Xbox or PC. Um, and I say PC, I mean PC as a whole. Not this whole Steam versus GOG versus Epic launcher garbage. Because Epic exclusives are basically paid exclusives and they're garbage within of themselves. They are the example of the worst part about the exclusivity in our current industry. Four specific titles. We looked at games that are over a year old, so they've been on Xbox and PC for a while. Uh, a couple of the games are community-driven games, new games that kind of first iterations of a franchise that have reached their full potential, I'd say, on Xbox and PC. There's always growth. Franchises that we obviously want to continue to invest in. Parting, part of having the ability to continue to invest is that the businesses behind those franchises continue. Um, we think it's important that these service-based games that have communities behind them, that they can have confidence that they're going to exist in the future. So two of them, kind of community-driven games that will end up on other platforms and give us the ability to continue to invest in them. We think that's great for the business and great for the communities, more players to play with. I'd say two of the other games are smaller games that were never really meant to be built as kind of platform exclusives and all the fanfare that goes around that, but games that our teams really wanted to go build, that we love supporting creative endeavors across our studios regardless of size. And as they've realized their full potential on Xbox and PC, we see an opportunity to utilize the other platforms as a place to just drive more business value out of those games, allowing us to invest in maybe future iterations of those, so sequels to those, or just other games like that in our portfolio. And when we don't damage Xbox and we can grow our business using what other platforms have and to, to help us with that, we're going to do that. And, and that's really the story behind these four games. And the last thing I'll say, looking forward, you know, I, I think there are there is an interesting story for us of introducing Xbox franchises to players on other 
platforms to get them more interested in Xbox. We think there's a, a good brand value for Xbox there. So four games, no promise beyond that. So if you're on those other platforms and you see these four games coming, please don't take it as some signal that everything's coming. It's not. Um, and we're going to learn. All right. So what we can ultimately take away from that is, you know, per usual, the internet kind of took the, the, the rumors and they blew it out of proportion. I mean, it, uh, it wasn't even any of the games that were listed. I mean, he doesn't specifically say Hi-Fi Rush, but he also talked about games that were like a year old. Nevertheless, I don't really see an issue in this concept of these console manufacturers deciding, hey, we have an exclusive game. And we're going to say uh, like a direct first party. So when I mean direct first party, meaning they made the game. They didn't pay another studio to make it exclusive on their system. And a year down the road, they feel that it has ultimately done everything that it could do on the Xbox ecosystem, on the PlayStation ecosystem, on the Nintendo ecosystem, which the last one is probably more impossible than the first two. Then let's now take that game and put it out there for a larger audience. To me, from a business perspective, that actually makes a lot of sense for them to do. You are thinking about the future and this concept of live service games, games that can benefit from bigger audiences, new audiences. How does that apply to future titles and how you're applying that criteria there? Yeah, there's really no fundamental change to how we think about exclusivity. We just came out of Developer Direct, which was an awesome show, um, where we showed great games that are coming to Xbox and PC and cloud, which really makes them accessible to you know hundreds of millions of people. So it's this kind of, we're really focused on a couple platforms and what's going to show up there. Um, but our, our key of play the games you want with the people you want, anywhere you want, when anybody play, when everybody plays, we all win. These have been part of our strategy. I'm going to agree with him here because I actually didn't know this. And I probably heard it, but never really gave it any thought. But I just recently found out that the stupid Xbox icon in my Windows application can directly be connected to my Xbox account. And any digital games that I have in my Xbox library, I can play and actually download to my computer and play them. So not even stream them from my Xbox to them. I can download them on my PC and the Xbox app or software just acts as a launcher. And I sat there and I thought, that's actually a great idea. I'm... I'm really surprised that I get that Microsoft, you know, they also do like Windows operating systems, but Sony, you know, the company that owns PlayStation creates their own PC. So I'm kind of surprised that they don't do that them themselves, because then that would allow them to also hit the digital rental market on PC platform for PlayStation exclusive games. So it's actually a way that PlayStation and both Xbox could be like, hey, we have our own app, our own launcher, and you can play our digital games that are exclusive or otherwise directly on your PC. Now, obviously, PlayStation doesn't currently do that. And I think that's, at least in my opinion, something that they should think about doing because I think it's a good idea. And then when we're talking about hardware too, there's these other considerations that are really important to our community, probably to each one of ourselves as well. When we when you talk about library, because I want to dig in on that a little bit more, yeah. you know, as we talk about cloud in the wider entertainment industry, there's conversations about streaming. How is that impacting how I own my content that I've invested in? So what can we say about our stance around game preservation? Yeah, you know, one of the highlights for me of, of being in this position was getting to stand on stage when we announced the back compat coming to Xbox One. Like it was fantastic. People were reading the teleprompter before I could read it. <laughs> reader. Um, and just feeling the energy in the in the uh, in the auditorium as we were saying that in online. You know, one of the cues I think us as being part of Microsoft take is looking at Windows and how Windows over decades has maintained software compatibility with things that are built on it. Like I can still go back and play some of the games that I love playing on Windows from decades ago and it will still run. And we try to bring that same view to consoles. It's harder in console because the line between what the hardware is and what the game is in consoles is traditionally, it's, it's tighter, which makes compatibility, you end up doing these generational compatibilities that we've built. But I will say compatibility, the ability to not only play the games, but my saves are still there with our cloud save systems yeah. to try to keep the services up as long as we can so that people can play is a tenant of what we are as Xbox. It's at our foundation. And when we look at future hardware generations and what we're going to support, making sure that we respect, which is the word I use, respect the investments that people have made in Xbox going forward is fundamental. And the fact that you get entitlements when you buy a game from us on both Windows and Xbox also means you have the ability to play that game um, across a multitude of devices, which I think furthers the compatibility of the games that you I've always thought it's always been like a big W for uh, Microsoft because they're not even the ones that started the whole backwards compatibility. It was PlayStation back in the PlayStation 2 era. It was massively successful for them. 
and they kind of redid that in the early PS3 era, but then following newer models of the PS3, they removed the PS2 being backwards compatibility, which I think was a big uh, L for them. So I think this is a massive win for Microsoft because at the end of the day, I find it very convenient that I can just take my 360 and some Xbox games and put them in my uh, Xbox system and play them. I also like the fact that kind of what he was talking about earlier where you can go, he didn't mention it specifically, but you can go to like, you can buy games that say 360 and, you know, the new Xbox or Xbox One and they'll work in either or machine. So I think ultimately, you know, PlayStation started it and then basically Microsoft took what they gave up on and I think they improved upon it and they've stuck with it. And I think that's a, definitely a positive, at least in the realm of game preservation. And I hope that future consoles of, you know, the Xbox will continue this backwards compatibility because I think it will only benefit and it will be a win for them, especially if PlayStation ultimately, and Nintendo, because Nintendo pretty much only really did it for their handheld system. Kind of hard to take a disc and get it working for the uh, Switch. This is all I have to say about this overall uh, podcast and in relation to the rumors and all of the talk that was going on, I think it was kind of blown out of proportion. Like I did do a video on it, but my talk was more about the mistakes that I feel or felt that Xbox was doing. I'll leave a link to that in the description box below if you want to go check it out. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video in some fashion or form. And remember, gamers, if you're not voicing your thoughts, concerns about the bullshit in gaming, overpriced games, games being unpolished upon release, and not just games like No Man's Sky, Fallout 76, Redfall, but all games, yes, I'm sorry, even Larian Studios is guilty of this with Baldur's Gate 3. You just might be a part of the motherfucking problem.